Good morning, everybody. I am thrilled that you guys are all able to join us today. Um, I'm going to go and get, go ahead and get started because the first minute or two of this is me blathering on, and I want to get as much time as we can for our panelists and for some time for uh, questions and answers at the end of the session. My name is Adam Layton. I am the chair of the International Federation for Emergency Medicine's Critical Care uh, Special Interest Group uh, and an assistant professor of emergency medicine and anesthesiology and critical care at Johns Hopkins. Um, and I'm thrilled that you guys can all join us today. Um, this is a sort of unique special session being co-presented by the International Federation for Emergency Medicine's Critical Care Special Interest Group, GEMA, and the SAEM, SAEM Critical Care Interest Group. So thank you very much to both of those groups for co-sponsoring with us. Um, I'm going to uh, jump in a little bit and then give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Um, no no uh, disclosures to disclose, no conflicts to disclose. Um, really, the objectives of this session, this is a little bit of a uh, Global Health 2.1 or 3.1, whatever, a little bit of a uh, two, um, uh, deeper dig into some of the interesting issues that come up as we uh, do educational pro uh, projects in uh, emergency departments in low resource settings. Um, so the objectives really are to identify some of the differences in how you think about a resuscitation in a low, uh, resource limited setting or and in a lower middle income country. Some of the differences in training models and how that affects approaches to uh, resuscitation. Thinking about developing a framework for how you're going to adapt your teaching strategies to those sorts of high stakes situations. And then uh, recognizing some of the ethical challenges that go with all of this. Um, with that, I want to introduce our very illustrious panel of colleagues, uh, of. Uh, uh, panelists. Maybe I'll let you guys introduce yourselves if you could just give us, you know, your name, your institution, a little bit about your background and work in resource limited settings. And then we'll jump into a case to sort of give us some structure to our conversation. Desalyn, do you want to start? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Adam. My name is Desalyn Kenley. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Saint, uh, and working in Ethiopia. St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College. I, I served in emergency department for four years and currently I'm uh, uh, on critical care fellowship. I have also served as uh, COVID treatment center uh, director and disaster response mm -hmm. team lead for two years. Thank you. Not, not to put Desolate on the spot, but you were in the third cohort of emergency medicine residents at, or fourth at Tikorambesa? One of the first few um, uh, cohorts of emergency medicine residents and the first cohort of critical care fellows uh, at his training center is really a, a leader in the field in his country. Um. There's a little switch on the side. Um, Grace Jatsiga, I'm an emergency medicine physician working in Malawi. Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. It's one of the largest central hosp uh, referral hospitals in Malawi. I trained in South Africa where I did my emergency medicine. Currently, I'm the head of the emergency unit at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. Thank you. I'm Nana Sifa. I am assistant professor of emergency medicine at Georgetown School of Medicine, doing both critical care and ED at Washington Hospital Center. I'm Andrew Beck. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Brown University and a member of the Division of Global Emergency Medicine, focused primarily on research and teaching emergency medicine and uh, critical care type medicine in the global and international uh, low and middle income, less developed setting. Most of my work is in Rwanda and Kenya. Great. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into a case. Um, Uh, so we have a case of a 26-year-old woman who was brought in by EMS after being struck by a car walking across the street about 15 minutes ago. Probably not uh, a terribly unfamiliar situation for anybody in the room. On primary survey, she's hypotensive, tachycardic, tachypnic, with a GCS of 7. Okay. Um, the only background that you know, she's a healthy mother of two with no known past medical history. And uh, she's showing up to Andy Center uh, in uh, Rhode Island Hospital. Um, so, Andy, tell us a little bit, you know, when, when this patient shows up to your hospital in Rhode Island, who's going to see her, what's the workflow, what's the initial management for her? 
Sure. So a patient like this brought in with this kind of situation, those kind of vital signs would be pretty much immediately recognized as a major polytrauma. They would be seen by a multidisciplinary team comprised of emergency medicine, trauma surgery, multiple nurses, multiple technicians at a minimum. There'd be both attending and resident level coverage for them. Um, within five minutes of entering the hospital, they would be immediately in a patient room, uh, primary survey conducted, initial x-rays obtained, IV access obtained, connected to a monitor, undressed, labs imaging ordered, any secondary studies ordered as well, and any appropriate initial management ordered as well. And that would all occur probably within the first handful of minutes at the absolute longest in a case like this, maybe 20 to 30 minutes to have a primary survey, lab, secondary survey, x-rays, medications, fluids, resuscitation well underway. Great. Um, and I'm going to give you a very similar case. Um, slight changes here. This is, she was now carried in by bystanders. It's been six hours since the time of her injury, so prolonged pre-hospital delay. And instead of being in Rhode Island, uh, she's not a Saba with this time around. So Desilene, tell us a little bit about um, when a patient like this presents to your hospital, what's her initial uh, evaluation look like? So, uh, in our... Uh, in our setting, uh, the patient's management depends on uh, where she presents, her economic status, uh, and uh, 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 the pres presence of uh, pre-hospital service or not. So based on different settings, the different uh, management options we run. Uh, in, specifically in my uh, department, uh, it's tertiary hospital resources are relatively uh, available, though some resources are uh, scarce. So uh, patients will be triaged to the rate and uh, uh, resuscitated, uh, especially in our setting we have emergency physicians uh, uh, day and night, residents are also there, and CT scan uh, is also available. So uh, patient will go through triage, resuscitation in the red zone, and specialty consultations. Uh, however, uh, in most uh, settings of Ethiopia, it's not like that. Uh, we have only few specialized centers having uh, emergency specialists and resources like imaging and uh, massive transfusion. So uh, our health system uh, is built based on uh, primary care unit, general hospital, and tertiary hospitals. So in the tertiary hospitals and general hospital, emergency physicians may be there. But uh, uh, in some of the general hospitals, uh, private hospitals and primary uh, care units like uh, primary hospitals, there are no uh, emergency physicians. Uh, so patients will be uh, triage, uh, but the care uh, seems uh, really compromised because there is no uh, expertise and the emergencies are also uh, uh, less organized, but the patient uh, uh, as you can see from the beginning, this delay is typical of emergency presentation uh, uh, in our setting. Uh, and also, most of the patients present uh, are carried into hospital uh, by general transportation. Uh, in one of the studies done, even in our capital trauma center, uh, in 2022, uh, only 40% of the patients were uh, carried in by uh, EMS and ambulance services. So. Uh, uh, according to the setting and based on the patient's financial capacity also there will be significant difference uh, in overall emergency care. In uh, some of the private set, uh, settings with advanced services, uh, if patient affords and the system is there, the care may be uh, very, very good. Great, so you know, I, I think that you guys um, are getting a sense that uh, who are the members of the team, both within the emergency department and outside of the emergency department, changes very much from one setting to another, and even very much from one setting within the same city to another, um, in terms of availability of people with emergency medicine training, uh, consulting specialists like trauma surgeons, neurosurgeons, intensivists, um, some of the other uh, uh, affiliated uh, staff that we rely on heavily, in, in at least in my emergency department for short of respiratory therapists, the clinical pharmacists, the nurses with critical care expertise, um, often are not available in, in many of the settings um, 
uh, around the world. So that really has to change how we think about approaching resuscitation. Um, I, I'd like to ask uh, some of the other panelists to talk a little bit more about when this patient hits the door in your department, um, who, are, who are the people that are going to be initially resuscitating them, uh, actually on the team uh, there, um, and what sorts of you know, training and background do they have? Chris, do you want to maybe start? So at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, uh, triage system is done, triage is done by the nurses. So once the patient arrives, they'll be seen by the nurses who probably will triage this patient red, then they'll go to the red zone. Uh, in terms of the clinical, clini clinical team that's there, so we have emergency physicians, we have clinical officers, and we have medical officers. So those are the fr frontline workers. Uh, so you know, on, a, on a good day, because we only have four emergency, emergency physicians the whole hospital. So our shifts are usually, the, so usually do a whole week's shift. So we only do day shifts, and the night they call you over the phone. So it depends on what time of the day they call, the, the patient arrives. If it's in the daytime, then they might, the, the emergency physician might be on duty. If it's a night shift, then there might not be an emergency physician. It could, could be a registrar or a clinical officer or a medical officer. So that, that's, that's a team that would do the primary survey. Uh, in terms of um, investigations, so the lab operates 24 hours, so they, they'll, get, they'll be able to get their investigations done. In terms of radiology, uh, radiology our x-ray, so that's um, radiographs will be done 24 hours, they should be able to get that. Uh, CT scan operates at night, you have to call the radiographer in to do CT scans. So also sort of triage patients who you need to scan immediately or those that can wait. For this patient, then we would have to call the radiographer in from home to come and do the CT scan. We don't have any tra trauma surgeons, but we have orthopedic surgeons, we have a neurosurgeon, we have intensivists. Uh, our ICU is four bedded, so sometimes you also have to triage who, need, who goes to ICU or not. Um, our system is free of charge, so we, we see everyone, no matter your uh, economic status, so you'll be tre treated the same. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Nana, do you want to talk a little bit about where you've been working in Ghana? Yeah, so whilst we are giving this contrast between Providence, Rhode Island, or Addis Ababa, one thing that I want audience to also get in perspective is even within the United States, there are sections and pockets that are completely different in terms of resources. If you make it to a reservation or to Alaska or to some places, the contrast may be as stark as Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, Addis Ababa. In, in Ghana, where I've had interactions with most of your experience depends on which hospital you are sent to. You could have an experience where within Accra, some of the private facilities, you could have an experience similar to you have in, in Washington, D.C., where I work most of the time. Uh, short of having a trauma team available to meet you, you may roll in and if you appear in your whole clinic, you have an emergency physician meet you, triage you, and bring all the resources as needed. In, the, in that same context, you, you go up the road to a different district hospital and you may, be encounter, you may encounter a medical officer who is seeing you and has not had training in emergency medicine or trauma, but has encountered similar experiences and learned uh, more by experience. And the care you get in these two places will be very different and your outcome completely different based on where you show up and how you show up. For instance, depending on where your accident happens in Accra, you may get an ambulance to transport you. Whereas in other places, it may be family or friends putting you at the back of a cab to bring you to the hospital. Because the EMS system may not be cover the whole city and in some areas not available. So those differences exist, and I would want to believe even within the U.S., in some rural contexts, you may have some of these experiences where the exp for you, how you experience the healthcare system is completely different. For instance, in Washington, D.C., if you roll in, before you even come in, there's a level one trauma called for this patient. The team ready to take you and deliver the care, whereas in some other places you may have to experience an emergency physician who is in a one-man shop delivering care, trying to stabilize you, and then ship you up the road if they can. Thanks. Andy, anything you want to add?
No, not particularly. I do very much agree with what he said, though. It's like this is much more a matter of resource limitation and what you have available determines the resuscitation that you can succeed and um, successfully pull off or, or not. Yeah, thanks. I think it's the other point that you guys have brought up that is an important one that probably took me longer in my career to, to really internalize than it should have is that when somebody's training in an emergency medicine residency in certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, they're usually at the tertiary academic referral centers where often their patients have been initially seen at a primary hospital and referred there. Um, often those patients aren't prim uh, presenting primarily. And so there's a very sort of nuanced resuscitation to how those patients are approached at those centers. But most of those trainees are gonna go on to work in other settings, you know, either private hospitals within cities or uh, rural district hospitals where the workflows can be very different from the centers where they trained. To that point, and it becomes very important as you're doing delivering training in this context to be nuanced about your training because you don't want to train a provider who can only work in the tertiary center, but then you want a provider who can work in the tertiary center and deliver that care, but also uh, amenable and pliable enough to work in some of these other locations where the resources may be very different, but deliver a level of care, hopefully close enough, if not at par, to the level a patient will get at the tertiary center. Yeah, and, and what we see in Ethiopia is that often those, refer, those rural resource limited centers that they go to, the emergency physicians are then the advocates and the leaders building those up into being the referral centers and the academic centers within that uh, district. Yeah, um, Adam, at times too, and just to put this out into the, into the air here, not to open up a conversation about it, but one thing that uh, was mentioned by Dr. Deslin, by Dr. Grace as well, is that cost varies quite a bit depending on your setting and your location, your country, your city, your insurance situation. In some cases, you receive no care if you can't pay. In other cases, it's completely free. If we think about it, to some extent, that's true here too, though we don't talk about it as much as perhaps we should. Um, people can be saddled with very large bills in the USA, even though how many of you have ever, ever said to someone, you don't have to worry about that. We have options to help you with this. You never have to worry if you can't pay for care, we can help you. That's only true to a certain extent. You know, and we have a, there's a burden that we place on people as well when we're not careful with use of resources even here. Yeah, thanks. Um, any other thoughts that you guys want to mention in terms of the trainees that you're working with in a, in a resuscitation in your centers in Africa about you know, when, when a very sick patient comes in um, what are your focuses as a as an educator there? So I think when uh, very sick patients come in, I think uh, we have to train our trainees to know when to stop and when to continue. So sometimes, because of the limited resources, we can't go all the way. As I said, we only have four ICU beds. So if I decide to intubate a patient, where am I that taking that patient to? So you have to choose who you're intubating, who you're not, who and that's, that's unfortunate part about it. So you, you decide who you're going to sort of continue with care, who you're going, no, not going to. So sometimes you have to define which, uh, like futility, who's, who, what's the outcome, outcome for this patient? Am I going to continue with this, am I not? And then teach the students still that if, in the, if, if we're in a good resource setting, this is what we're supposed to do. But because we are here, this is what we're doing. And sometimes it's hard for you to make that decision. I think we have one American trained doctor who works with us. So I think, although she's been there for almost three years now, she still struggles to make that decision. So she still, she'll still make a call at, at midnight. Sometimes she'll wake up at midnight to go and see a patient. She'll, she'll intubate the patient and in the end they'll tell, oh, there's no ICU bed. So you're stuck with this patient and you can't do anything about it. So we try and sometimes talk to each other, make the decision together. If it's a head injury patient like this, sometimes before you intubate the patient, you call neurosurgery, they'll tell you, oh, I don't have theater space. ICU doesn't have a bed. So if you, even you think it's a young person who has good prognosis, but if you don't have resources, you can, there's not much, much you can do about it, then you have to stop. Whereas at um, Rhode Island Hospital, Brown University, 
Hopkins, Washington, D.C., the places where several of us work up here, the point of futility would be defined by a code that's lasted half an hour or more and exhausting pretty much most of your resources when you realize the patient will simply just not survive. Now, that's obviously a blanket statement. There is nuance to that. But for the most part, in a large tertiary care academic center in the USA, uh, we don't consider whether or not there's an ICU bed available. If there's not, we call another hospital to find another one and transfer the patient somewhere else. Or we get in a fight with the ICU doctor over the phone and tell them to move someone else out, right? Yeah, and this issue of utility is also very nuanced and important to have because it's context uh, specific. Uh, I, I remember many years ago I was at a conference where there was a discussion, do you resuscitate uh, a cardiac arrest patient if they arrest in the streets of Africa? And there was two schools of thought. One school saying, no, the survival rate of cardiac arrest is so low, even in resource uh, rich settings, that why do you want to do that in the streets in Africa? But then you look at it, many people also, another school of thought was like, many people are arrested for arrhythmias and things that if you can get them out of the arrhythmia, they may come back completely normal and they may need a pacemaker or something down the line. So where do you stop? Which means that in, in the determination of utility, you always have to not limit that decision to the resources you have in the immediate vicinity, but take a more uh, uh, step, ba step back approach to say, yes, it may be limited, but sometimes there are quick wins that you can get that may uh, obviate the need of all the resources. Great, thanks. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've uh, talked about this already. You know, this is somebody who's hypotensive and tachycardic. She has a low GCS concerning for a head bleed. Um, and, you know, Grace, you already mentioned th the struggles sometimes that American doctors have in trying to adapt to that. H how have you seen these sorts of, uh, you know, education in these sorts of high-stakes situations either going really well or going really poorly with those uh, east-west, north-south, American-African uh, interactions? So for my unit, we sort of have seen the need to sort of, you might be a consultant here, but if you come to Africa, you, you'll still be a consultant, but the things that are there would be very different. And sometimes you'd fail to cope. So we've tried to make it that whoever is coming, we'll give you time. So when you're on call, the first shifts, you're on call with a, with a fellow consultant. So we encourage sort of uh, talk, talking to a fellow consultant to just find out if, what, if your decision is the right decision for the situation that you have. So we encourage that so that at, by the time you're on call alone, at least you have, you, you know the nitty gritties of what to do. Sometimes we've even joked, somet sometimes when you're on call, most of the things that you're doing are actually administrative than patient care. Because sometimes you come on a shift and they tell you, oh, we don't have this drug and you can't work without that drug. So you leave the patient care and start sorting out the administration things so that you have, at least have enough resources for, the sh for that shift. So we've encouraged, uh, um, being open and discussing every, uh, all the patients at the, at the beginning of, of their rotation in, in the unit. So at, that, at the time they are being left alone to be on call, they are comfortable with most of the situation, situations that they might uh, encounter. So even if you've stayed for a long time, you're still welcome to, to, to call, call us at the middle of the night and we discuss whatever situation it is so that it makes, it's, it's comfortable for the person working. And it's also comfortable for the students. Sometimes they might ask a student or a medical officer who has no idea, because they might not know what actually the gold standard for, standard for treatment for that condition is, because they are used to the lowly set setting, setting. So they might not be aware of the knowledge that you have and you want to do something, and they might say, no, don't do it, because they don't know about it. So if you talk to a fellow consultant, they will, then they will guide you to do the right thing. Yeah, I think the talking with people who are familiar with the local culture and local context and local capability is probably the most important thing there. That way you are providing culturally competent and situationally appropriate teaching and education to somebody. Uh, it's, you know, it's often easy in a case like this to say, polytrauma, head bleed, CAT scan, blood, OR, ICU, intubate, et cetera, et cetera. And to some extent, everyone knows that that's what is kind of the 
the picture of care that this person will receive in a world where there was unlimited resources, unlimited money, and unlimited everything. Um, but you can cause harm by teaching that poorly if you're, especially if you're someone not familiar with the setting. And frequently, those of us in this room are probably involved in global emergency medicine and global teaching to some extent. And if you're going somewhere to teach, especially if you're teaching a trainee who hasn't yet been taught in their own system, let's say you're rotating through a hospital and are working with medical students or residents there, and you teach them a standard that doesn't apply to their center, that will actually set them on an educational pathway that might be ineffective for their setting and cause them to waste resources or allocate things inappropriately. Uh, that creates some risk to you as an educator to make sure you're appropriately tailoring your discussion to the situation. And in a similar way, when you change hospitals, even within this country, each hospital is different and you sort of have to adjust. So you may be an expert in medicine and everybody knows you know medicine as it is, but you do not know the context. You do not know how things operate in that area in the same way when you relocate to a different continent. You need to, as much as you know medicine, you need to, I personally defer a lot of things, especially when it involves the context to the locals to make that decision or to help me make that decision because I may understand what I want to do, but it may not work in this context and you don't want to waste anybody's time. Great, thanks guys. So um, a a as we continue to evaluate this patient, she's noted to have Bruising, swelling, and a step off over her left uh, hemicranium. She has a dilated left pupil. She has a left thigh deformity. Um, you know, I, I think we've touched on a lot of the things that we would ideally like to be able to provide for this patient within the first minutes, you know, within the first hour of care, certainly of this patient being in the emergency department, including an EFAST, PAN scans, x rays, uh, seizure meds, analgesia, um, transfusion, resuscitation. Um, medications for sedation and intubation, a splint for, you know, presumed uh, left femur fracture, uh, and then uh, urgent uh, specialty consultations. Um, when you guys are working in an African emergency department, uh, how are you, I, you know, modifying what resources you're asking for, what resources are available? Um, you know, certainly th this is somebody who we'd be pulling out the level one in a cooler of blood for. Um, you know, on arrival, if not sooner, to, to my hospital in Baltimore. How, how feasible or not feasible is that for you guys uh, in, in lower resource settings? Deslin, do you want to maybe start? Yeah. So in, in our setting, uh, especially um, in tertiary centers where ultrasound and imaging is available, most of these things uh, could be uh, provided. Uh, but uh, in general and uh, uh, primary hospitals I mentioned, uh, ultrasound may be available. Sometimes we go for training to these hospitals and uh, no, nobody is using the ultrasound. Uh, so the culture of using EFAST especially uh, uh, is more limited to emergency physicians in our country. Uh, and uh, uh, emergency training started just in 2010, and uh, currently we're having uh, uh, seven university hospitals running uh, emergency medicine uh, specialty training. And with this, uh, use of ultrasound uh, and other resources uh, has been better in these centers, but uh, in other areas, uh, skill and uh, uh, development of skill and further training is still needed. Yeah, look at that list, and as much as I wish it could all happen in, in Ghana, you look at a PAN scan and you ask yourself, how much is that going to cost for the patient? And who is going to pay for it? So depending on who is coming in, you may defer the scan, and in Kumasi, for instance, and people rely heavily on the ultrasound because the ultrasound is owned by the department, and it's... Uh, the emergency physicians use it relatively at no extra cost to the patient, whereas if you order a pan scan head to toe, so yes, in this patient you may hope you can get a, a CT scan of the head and bag in some of the other uh, body parts to ultrasound or x-ray imaging because each CT will have to be paid for before the patient gets it. And uh, chances are this patient did not roll into the hospital with a bag of cash ready to pay for all this. But unfortunately, that's the reality that uh, people, people face. For instance, blood transfusions, you may be able to get a couple of units initially to 
start the resuscitation, but a lot of crystalloids will have to go in because in the end, on the back end, the patient and family may need to replenish the hospital's stocks. So it's always a balance of, yes, this is what I could do, but what in this context is affordable and really what is needed because, because of the extra cost or the initial cost to the patient, you, you basically have to select what you really need to deliver the care and things that you wish you had but could do without, you do without. So you know, I, I think we've touched a lot on the, the, um, the challenges in terms of have, you know, wanting to get a, a CAT scan that may not be available in a timely or cost-effective fashion, uh, the, the challenges around money and, and not being able to provide the care that you'd like to uh, in terms of uh, studies or medications that need to be paid for in advance. Um, and then some of those issues about, you know, if, if your expert consultants are saying, we're not going to, op you know, we're not going to take this patient to the OR or we don't have an ICU bed for this patient, um, how, how that uh, can change the care that you're able to provide. Um, other th uh, things about this that you guys want to add before we move on? Great. Um, and, you know, I, I think we've talked a lot about how those sorts of resource limitations can affect a patient's outcome. Um, I, we haven't really talked about as much how that, you know, how the arrival of a very sick patient can affect the rest of the patients in the emergency department. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that, you know, of I if you end up diverting all of your resources towards resuscitating a patient who requires a lot of resources, uh, what that means for the, the other patients in the department or in the waiting room. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets at the ethical principle of justice. How do you decide how to allocate resources appropriately? And this happens in all settings, even in our own. I remember when I was still in residency, we had uh, three codes happen at the same time. And as a resident, I was left unsupervised to run one of them while one of the attendings went and ran another one. And another attending from a different department came and ran the third not knowing any of the patients. You know, this happens to us even in our own settings. And during that period of time, all the other patients who are intubated on pressors or just in need of a workup or review of labs or meds ordered, that all got delayed. Um, it happens to an even greater degree of magnitude in cases where you have fewer resources available. Uh, a good example in a lot of, uh, not necessarily in the USA, is these uh, compounds aren't really very popular around here, but anywhere where organophosphates are still widely in existence, uh, organophosphate toxicity can deplete a hospital of its entire supply of atropine and benzodiazepines. Uh, and, f and if you think about that for a moment, if you need the hospital's entire supply to save one patient, it's not likely that that patient is actually savable, or will they have a meaningful outcome at the end of all that without major neurotoxicity and consequences? So it brings up the question of, do you allocate all that to that one person and keep a resuscitation going, or save some of it for the next three that come in that might be less severe? I don't think there's a good answer to that question, except to recognize that there's no doubt that uh, inappropriate use of resuscitative resources can cost patients uh, who you could have otherwise saved. You know, we do a lot of triaging in mass casualty incidents in the USA where we say that once someone is futile, if we can't save them, use the rest of the resources to save those who you can save. And the same kind of logic, um, I believe, can be applied to this situation. Yeah, I look at the situation like how I see a night shift in most of our EDs. I'm not sure how many of our shops have more than four attendance on a night shift. My, my current shop recently transitioned from two attendants to three, but if you, if you have two attendants working and in, some, in many places it's one person on the night shift, ask yourself, what do you do when the code comes in and how long do you run that code knowing that you have other, if not equally sick patients who are pericode that you need to take care of? And in the same way, in in many of these places, for instance, as Grace mentioned, there are four emergency physicians who work day shifts, which means they have to work with those resources of uh, the human resource that they have. And how do you balance that in when you have a patient who comes in and needs to be resuscitated? In most of these things, I would say you you try to use as limited of a resource for the patient who is there, knowing that you keeping in mind that you will need other resources for other patients and how do you, how you balance that. I don't think there's a perfect answer. And there are days you walk away from a shift thinking, oh, I could have done this better and utilize this resource in a different way. But you learn from that, that day and you get better the following day. 
Um, and, and we've touched on this a little bit, but talk a little bit more about what happens downstream for these critically ill patients when they are successfully resuscitated in, in the emergency department um, in terms of resources for getting them to the operating room, getting them to an intensive care unit, and then long-term, if, if they survive their initial uh, injury and re uh, uh, resuscitation. And then in, in light of that, um, how does that affect your discussions about when to continue or to discontinue a resuscitation? So um, having mentioned that we have four ICU beds, uh, the downstream care is also dependent on the av available resources at that side. I think we have noted that sort of our, most of our head injury patients also have a poor prognosis. So once they go to ICU, they take a longer time to come out, so they sort of block the bed as well. So as in our unit now, the critical care team has also decided, once you have an, uh, a head injury patient, you go to theater, if you, can, you go to ICU, once you can start breathing on, the, on your own, they'll put you on a, on a, on a, tra a trachea tube, then you can go to the ward for continued care. So that, 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 that way they free out the beds earlier so that other patients can go. Otherwise, if we had all the resources, I'd keep them longer. But now they're trying to shorten the time they stay in ICU so that they can free the beds. I think we've also, we also seen a, an increase in um, head injuries because of motorbike accidents. So that has also strained the, the system more. So that's the only way out. So if you resuscitate them, they go to ICU, they, they put them on a trachea tube, and then they, they go to the ward. Um, in, other, in other units as well, orthopedics, um, they also have sort of a backload of patients that's waiting for theater. But usually if they are resuscitated, they go to the ward. Most of them will do well. Unless you're very, very sick, then chances of survival are still are poor. In some of these resource limited settings, you may have a new emergency medicine program without the back end critical care services. And some places have evolved to holding these critically ill patients in the ED till they can go to the floor. But that also means that if you have four uh, ventilators in your ED and you're going to hold an, uh, an intubated patient for three or four days in the ED because you have no ICU to send them to, that takes away from your fall. So I remember many years ago, it was not uncommon in, in CAT in Kumasi, where there were patients in the ED for three, four days intubated, taken away from their resources. But fortunately, they now have an upstairs ICU, which would absorb those patients. But that's something that people had to balance with. It's like, this person will be in the ED till they can be extubated. How long do I anticipate that's going to take? And if it's going to take a week or longer, probably don't go down the route of intubating. Oh, this person, I think it's going to be 24, 48 hours. We can do this. So you are making, unfortunately, very difficult decisions that some of us had to do during COVID, but you're doing it as a lifetime. So uh, regarding uh, especially traumatic brain injury patients, uh, in my practice, I, I learned that we need to be somehow careful about their outcome because uh, it depends on the type of injury. So when uh, I was resident in the emergency, most of severe traumatic brain injury patients were dying. So our expectation uh, was that they are not salvageable and we had such conclusion. Later with uh, improvement of neurosurgical services uh, and uh, overall emergency uh, department improvement uh, in uh, 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 service with uh, graduation of emergency physician and the resuscitation process, uh, we could see improvement in uh, uh, survival of uh, severe traumatic brain injury patients. Uh, so uh, I think that should be decided by multidisciplinary team and uh, based on also type of the injury. Uh, especially I remember a case uh, uh, where a patient, 33 year old male patient had severe traumatic brain injury polytrauma and such patients were uh, in our uh, uh, initial setting, previously they were almost dying. And uh, however, this patient uh, was uh, uh, airlifted from around 700 kilometers to Addis. Uh, resource was available for this patient and he had massive epidural hematoma. Hematoma was evacuated and hemicraniotomy was done. And that patient was managed in ICU for around two months, then he was transferred to ward and la lastly discharged walking. That was a learning point for me. Uh, and I think over time, uh, even severe traumatic brain injury patient management 
uh, would improve. Uh, and uh, in terms of triage, mostly discussed, uh, there is what we call blue triage in uh, uh, mass casualty situation, uh, and where we cannot, uh, uh, we think that patient is not salvageable for genuine reasons, we need to prioritize for uh, salvageable patients uh, so that we can use our resource efficiently. Great, thanks. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on your guys' roles as an educator. Um, and so how do you see your position in, in these sorts of resuscitations when you're working in a low resource setting? Are you the instructor, the supervisor? Are you functioning as a role model? I mean, especially for the Americans, you know, how is that different from how you see your role when you're working in your own institutions in the U.S.? Of the three things outlined there, I personally view my role only as an instructor. I think that in terms of the supervisor aspect, the role model aspect, maybe there's some relevance to those things. But at the end of the day, if I'm practicing in a context that I didn't personally train in and with which I'm less familiar, I want to be very culturally careful to not teach someone the wrong thing in the wrong context. And so in terms of teaching medicine, even teaching whatever the idealized medicine could be, we can start there and then say, now, from there, what can we actually achieve in this setting appropriately with the resources we have, with the patient's ability to pay, and with the system's ability to care for them in the aftermath? In some of these contexts, emergency medicine is completely new as a specialty, and some of the people may not have seen. So I, on the other side, see myself more as a role model, showing to the uh, trainees what emergency medicine in its whole spectrum could be like. And uh, in so doing, I'm having conversations on how the less critically ill patients should be treated versus how the critically ill patients, but giving them an idea of what the ideal could be, whilst also at the same time being culturally uh, sensitive to the fact that they may not, the ideal may, that I, I think of may be different. Each context may have a different ideal. So I'm trying as much as possible to model emergency medicine in a way that people can, can look at and say, OK, this is it. Whereas also definitely being nuanced and culturally con uh, conscious of the fact that what may be ideal for me in Washington, DC, is completely different from what the ideal may be, depending on where I am. So <clears throat> I think for me, it's all, all, all three. So Emergency medicine is new, so we have to be the role model for the younger generation, so we get more trainees in, our, in, our, in emergency medicine. Uh, we have to instruct the registrars that are there and supervise as well. So as I said, we have different levels of training. We have clinical officers, we have the medical officers, we have the registrars. So sometimes you actually have to be the supervisor and follow people and see what they're actually doing. Because sometimes if you don't do that, you find out by 4.30 the department is full and only 10 patients have been seen. And if it's on a day that you have a lot of administrative work, you still have to have a, a, at the back of your mind that I still have the unit to run. So you can run to that meeting, in, but in the, in, the back, in the background, also check what's happening in the unit. Because if you don't supervise the unit, sometimes people will just decide, I'll see one patient have coffee, see one patient have coffee. And by the time they, by, <laughs> by the time they, the time they knock off, you have the 30 patients waiting on the queue who need, who need to be seen. So you just have to be all three at the same time. Some experience we have uh, with regard to our role. Uh, our curriculum recently was changed to student center. Previously, more of an instructor model was running. Later, uh, the student center teaching curriculum was adapted uh, and implemented. And uh, especially uh, in the college I work, uh, the students, uh, undergraduate students, not emergency residents, undergraduate students became uh, really uh, part of emergency medicine, uh, and in the two hospitals running emergency residency uh, in Addis Ababa, the emergency medicine department is uh, taken as a role model and best teaching department for uh, consecutive two, three years in, in both teaching hospitals among all the departments. So uh, uh, emergency uh, medicine is uh, acting as a role model. Uh, not only for residents, overall, uh, uh, to undergraduate medical students, uh, as well as the whole uh, health healthcare system in Ethiopia. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go on. You know, I want to talk a little bit about how you work with American trainees 
when you're in a low resource setting, either your residents that are going overseas with you or for the, the providers working in Africa, when you have uh, foreign students coming to do a rotation in your unit. And then I uh, want to talk about that and then save a couple of minutes at the end for uh, questions from the audience. Do you guys want to, maybe uh, Nana and Andy can talk about working with US trainees in new settings? How do I put this? Personally, when I'm working with US trainees in a context like this, I have them on a relatively shorter leash than I would have them on when I'm working with that same resident in the US. Mainly because some uh, things like the cost, who is paying for this, are things that our trainees are not thinking about. And if you give them too much room, they could easily wrap up a significant expense for, for patients. Whereas, so, for instance, if I'm working with you in DC, I may tell you order whatever you want if you think it's clinically necessary. Whereas in Accra, I would be like, tell me what you want to order. Let's have that conversation of are these all necessary before you actually physically put the order? Because once you put the order, you give the stuff to the family, they are now thinking of the cost and things that you may not be thinking about. But in the same way, whilst you try to balance it, you also w want to make sure the student gets an experience that is worth having. And uh, whilst doing that, also allowing them to work with the locals to see how are they making these decisions or how do you decide, okay, these are the five orders that I really want to order, but the family says they have funds for three. Where do you draw the line and how, which three do you choose? I allow the residents to work with the locals to come to those decisions so they learn from it so that maybe by the end of their month, they can also start making some of those decisions and I would hope that when they come back to the States, they can, yes, as much as insurance will pay for it, you still ask yourself and is this really necessary, or am I doing it more for fun? We have, um, you know, a number of our residents get to rotate at, uh, at hospitals abroad, and, and that's true in our residency and in many. And, um, I, and I rotated in some when I was a resident too, but just a question for the audience. Would you say that a fourth year or third year resident has more medical knowledge than a first year? We would all say that, right? But who actually has more confidence the, a second year resident or a fourth year resident? You know, I think it's probably fair to say that a lot of us had a lot of confidence when we were in mid-residency. And then when we learned with experience that um, things can be a lot more nuanced and a lot more complicated than we often realize and then the, that the textbooks suggest, our knowledge increases and our confidence decreases, usually around mid to late residency. And then it starts to increase again, and then you know everything eventually goes up in parallel. But there's often a period of time where you are very confident, but don't necessarily have all of the knowledge or the experience to back that up. I think I, I can tell you personally, I was guilty of that. I think a lot of us probably were as well. A Dunning-Kruger phenomenon, we call that, right? Now, um, specific to residents rotating in other places, if anyone, if, if there was one thing I would have benefited from hearing before I went and did that as a resident, it would have been, um, you know, get a lot of input from the people that are there with you. I don't feel like I stepped in it when I was rotating abroad, but I saw many opportunities to do so if I hadn't, you know, been culturally attuned to what was going on. Because you could have stepped into a situation of a STEMI and felt like you knew exactly what to do and then totally ignored all the nuance that goes with that in other settings and really been possibly not right about the ultimate picture of management that somebody would require. So I think ultimately humility is probably the, the key word for the takeaway there. If you're um, still a trainee in your own country, rotating in another country, you're still a trainee. And even when you're not a trainee in your own country and are going to a different setting, whether that's in your own country or in someone else's, you're still a trainee again until you've figured out how everything works in that different context. Yeah, thanks guys. I, you know, I'll, I'll say that w one of my first uh, visits to Ethiopia as a medical student, um, at the end of every day I sat down with uh, the uh, Ethiopian doctor who I was working with. We stayed in the same hotel when we were out of Addis, and he, he like made it a policy of having a gin and tonic at the end of every day. Um, and he had very strong feelings about why it should be a gin and tonic. But we, we had you know, <laughs> half an hour of having a drink, sitting on the patio, and really debriefing at the end of the day. And I think it's easy for me, now that I've been working in Ethiopia for as many years as I have, to forget how important that is. Uh, but I've seen it 
number of medical students over the, or residents over the years who had a, you know, what they were really excited as a life-changing global health experience going abroad and come back and say, that was terrible, I'm traumatized, I never realized how terrible global health was, I'm doing something else now. Like that, I don't want that to be part of my career. And I think that you know, it, it's easy to forget how, how much there is to process with that and how much on, you know, on the ground learning there is with, with those uh, experiences. And so making sure that your students really have a chance to, you know, whether it's with you or with a local mentor, to process what they're seeing day to day and debrief and, and think through all the things that we've been talking about today can really change a traumatizing experience to a really powerful growth experience. Um, I want to stop here because, you know, I'm so appreciative of you guys all being here and um, uh, being such an attentive audience. Any questions or comments uh, from you guys? So my question is, um, how, what are the nuances and how do you kind of change your management? We talked about this being a 26 year old. How would you approach, how would you teach your trainees if this was, for example, a, a pediatric patient, eight year old, 10 year old? Interestingly enough, we wrote the case for it to be a nine year old. <laughs> We changed it because uh, we thought the conversation would flow a little bit better contextually within the centers that we work, but we initially drafted this as a nine-year-old girl. And uh, the, it only becomes more complicated from, from my perspective, especially given the issues of paying for cost, given the issues of identifying family support, and especially if this patient is brought in without any identifying information. So um, I've been in that situation. I imagine we all have. Um, I can tell you how it went in that moment, and I was extremely tempted to pull my wallet out and just hand over a bunch of cash myself, and I was told by the team there not to do it. Um, but we did as much in terms of resuscitation as we could do within what the center said would be acceptable in the standard of care in that situation uh, from an ethical and medical perspective, uh, which included um, getting some labs going, calling a neurosurgeon, uh, and then working to identify family. And one thing is, in most of these places, pediatric emergency medicine is, a, is even rare compared to general emergency medicine. So having the support and the backup of a PEM folks would probably not be likely. And you sort of have to partner with uh, general pediatricians who have worked in the ER uh, for a bit in terms of the research station. I, I just, I'm seeing that we're at time, um, right, we're over time, and so I, I encourage you guys to come up and uh, ask our panelists more questions or to hunt us down in the hallways. I really appreciate everybody being here. I wanna make sure we are respectful for the, the next group coming in um, and uh, let you guys uh, get to your next sessions also, but we'll hang around uh, either in the room or in the hallway for for a bit to, to talk more. And again, I'd like to ask for a big uh, round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> and especially for Grace and Desley, who both had 24 hour plus hour flights to be here with us. Um, And, and a quick plug, if anybody's interested in the overlap of global health, critical care, emergency medicine, resource limited settings, you guys are all members of the International Federation for Emergency Medicine by default as SAM or ASEP members. Uh, and we'd love to have you guys involved. Uh, reach out to me and find ways to get you guys involved with this thing.